life in them care about other people. We could probably call it one thing, and that's just compassion. We all need to be affected by the compassion of God for the broken, right? Because that's the heart of Jesus. Now, Jesus says, as you're doing all these things, remember this. Eternal life is not about that. You do that, but eternal life is about knowing him. So this is eternal life, to know God the Father and Jesus Christ the one he sent. That's out of John 17. However, as you are flowing in that relationship, just like Jesus did, he shared his life with people and shared his thing. So what we find is that sheep love to share. Sheep love to give. As they're following Jesus, they, they find out that to be a blessing is like the highest order of life for them because no thing on this earth satisfies. That new boat doesn't satisfy. That new car doesn't satisfy. That new house doesn't satisfy. They're all good things. God may bless you with all. I hope he does. But it doesn't satisfy because we're all about what we can give, how we can participate in the kingdom of God. Interestingly, he also mentioned strangers coming into our homes, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. But I want, I'm going to give some definition to all that in a minute. But um, many of you are doing great. You're visiting the sick. You're going into the jails. You're, you're sharing of your substance involved in, in food pantries and helping in so many ways. I know your heart. You're doing great. I want you to know there's great reward in expressing the life of Jesus in that way. There really is. You might even think that nobody notices, but God notices. See what I'm saying? Jesus knew who the sheep were because of how the sheep acted. Okay. All right, let's just talk for a minute about the gruff goats. I don't want to spend too uh, much time on that, but my observation is people that are goat-like, and everybody knows a goat, okay. <laughs> they are really bound in legalism. They're not free in their heart. They are just stuck. They might even be really religious. You can have religious people that are goats. They're in churches too. I mean, these are people, I think some of them were shocked how they ended up. I'm sure these goats are going, hold it, I went to church every Sunday, or I was part of XYZ, or I read this Bible. And Jesus says, yeah, but I didn't see the fruit of a sheep in your life. So here's what's true about goat-type people. They have an unhealthy independence from Jesus Christ, an unhealthy independence. I'm not, hey, listen, I know what it means. We need to be independent in the sense of who we are in God. We flourish. We're not limited by systems, but we're always bound to the leadership of Jesus Christ. So they're, they seem to fight the system. That defiance seems to come out regularly, whether they're part of a church or not. They are independent of the move of God. Many of them would claim to know it all. They seem to, you know, they, they just, I would say goat people are not good team players. They don't play nice with others. You know, team players, we have to learn how to mesh together for the greater good, isn't that right? Okay, and so, and so I wrote something that hit me on vacation was that a goat, is they butt a lot. You can see some pretty cool YouTubes about goats butting. In fact, there's one, look on there, a goat and a huge cow tangled like so this cow mama was kind of protecting her baby because a goat was walking over toward him they sparred off before god this is true and then you know a little bitty goat big old monster cow they hit each other and the cow fell over <laughs> i ain't kidding you that, that that cow was knocked out and the you know the goat just dazed but here goat goat type people but they but what, what the Bible, the Old Testament refers to as the ancient boundary stones. There are boundary stones that God sets up. You know, you read the life of Joshua, and they took uh, rocks out of the Jordan River as they came through it. God parted the Jordan River for Joshua and the people of Israel, and they set them up, and those stones were supposed to stay. And if you were given land in the promised land, there were boundary stones put up, and it was illegal to move them. And there are certain things about our faith that we shouldn't be moving. And, you know, like the Bible being inerrant and about Jesus born of a virgin and about the miracles that he did and all that. People are moving those boundary stones to their own demise. We need to stand on, on truth. So gruff goats do that. Um, sometimes they exchange what could be called cultural love. I don't think it's real love for biblical truth. And I think they need to redefine love the way the Bible does. But here's what I want to challenge you with. Are you ready to be challenged? I like a challenge now and again. I was really challenged by this passage 
and I hope you still like me, I think you will, after I share this truth of you. I think many of us have been conned into believing the wrong definition of the least of these. I wanna share with you that too many times I've gone to places where there are, for lack of a better word, vagrant people. You know, wherever it's warm, there are people like that. You know, God loves them, obviously, and all that kind of thing. And then when they hold out a sign, there's kind of this heart tug. And then you feel, wow, I didn't give that guy anything. Now he's going to die. You know, all that kind of stuff. And maybe you've been there. But I want to tell you, it is highly likely that person is not the least of these Jesus is talking about. Stay with me. Don't leave yet. Matthew 10, 40 to 42. See, the Bible defines the Bible. And already in Matthew 25, he kind of indicated uh, in verse 40, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Okay, so let's take that a little bit further. Matthew 10, 40 and 42. 40 to 42, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. He's talking to his disciples. Anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And then he gives some definition to people who are part of this disciple group. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet, they get a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person receives a righteous person's reward. And get this, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these, who is what? My disciple. Now, don't, I don't want you to hear that we shouldn't feed everybody or bless everybody. It's just that when Jesus mentions the least of these, he's not talking about everybody. Certainly not everybody that holds a sign. Come on now. Your responsibility, first and foremost, is to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Your responsibility, second, is to his body. Yeah, and then to the community at large. Yeah. And you almost need... You almost need a conversion at each level. You certainly need a conversion to get Christ. But a lot of people don't see that the body matters, how much Jesus cares about the body. And man, in the first century, if the body didn't help the body, they were in trouble. You know, you, you look at Acts chapter 2, what you don't see is a feeding program. You don't see a welfare program. What you see is the people of God selling out to help the people of God. I'll tell you who's done it right is the Mormons. We're being shamed by the Mormons. And I'm not saying anything about their theology. I'm just saying that in practice, they help one another. Okay. Everyone mentioned in Matthew 10, 40 to 42 is part of the body of Christ and verifiably so. Let it sink in. I don't even have all the answers to this stuff because I get my same heartstrings pulled by every blessed commercial for lost dogs to giraffes and kangaroos. <laughs> Everybody wants your money. But where should my money go? Where should my passion go? I believe the sheeps and the goats teach us that there's a high priority on the true least of these. Everyone mentioned that gets reward in Matthew 10, 40, 40 to 42 is part of the body of Christ, verifiably so, and you get to share in the reward of their ministry as you help them. And Jesus doesn't forget. Okay, Matthew 12, 48 to 50. Do you still love me? 46, 46. I'm going to back it up to 46. Jesus is talking to a crowd. Oh, boy, does this one get me. This one. His mother is who now? Josephine. No. Who's his mother? Come on. His mother and brother stood outside the posse. They're going to rescue Jesus from all this craziness. He's surrounded by people he can't eat. Everybody's demanding. We're going to get Jesus out and give him a vacation. They were wanting to speak to him, and someone told him, Hey, your mother and brothers, well, I guess if Mary's here, I better leave my ministry and go talk to her. Is that what Jesus said? Yeah. No, of course not. Because she's no more God than you are. Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak. By the way, Jesus had, after he was born, Mary was a virgin. Until after Jesus was born, he had four brothers and at least two sisters. I can prove that. Just not right now. 
Take my word. I can't take all day to prove everything, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> so Jesus, listen, Jesus replied, if you believe the Bible, you've got to grab onto this. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, they're all around him listening. Here, here are my mother and my brothers. And I will tell you, if you allow the body to be the body to you, and if you participate in the body, your tightest relationships in the world will be people of faith. If you allow that. Nothing wrong with your family. I hope your whole family's people of faith. But the truth is, what we have is deeper than the blood of the flesh level. We've got the blood of Jesus at the spirit level. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So it was not the flesh birth or the fact that we're American or the fact that we were raised in a Christian family or the fact that we went to a Christian school that gives us what Jesus is talking about is that we've made a choice to follow him and to do the will of God. We are passionately seeking to do the will of God, you and I. And that's really not possible without first knowing the Father, which comes through being born again. Right. Surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, now we're going to go on to Matthew 18. I'm just trying to give you a kind of proof of what I believe out of this passage that we just read, Matthew 25. So uh, I'll start back up verse 2. He takes a little child, places a child among him. Oh, boy, am I going to get people mad right now. He said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, we have to become like children who are dependent on their parents, right? A child without a parent is going to die. you gotta have, you got to have parenting. I wish more parenting would happen sometime, right? But anyway, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven, meaning complete and total trust in our heavenly Father. Therefore, who takes, whoever takes the lowly position of this child, which is a position of faith, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's when he's done talking about kids right there. He's talking about the faith of a child now. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. I want to say from this point on, he's not talking about kids anymore. He's talking about people that have the faith of like a child. Okay, so we've used these things. I don't care how you use it. I'm just saying that what Jesus intended was his disciples who have childlike faith. If anyone causes, verse 6, any one of these little ones to stumble, who are the little ones? The disciples of Jesus. Those who believe in me, he says, to stumble, it'd be better for them to have what? Man, millstones were monstrous. Do you imagine that tied around your neck and thrown in the sea? I'm going to jump ahead to verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, I'm saying it's not kids at all. It's those with childlike faith. For I tell you, their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father, in heaven. And on to verse 12, what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders, will he not leave the 99 on the hills to go look for the one that wandered off? This is all Jesus toward his disciples. Jesus talking about really what he did in Matthew 25, the least of these. If he finds that, I tell you, he's happier than about one with one sheep than about the 99 in the same way your father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones perish. The little ones being the disciples. Okay. Finally, uh, Hebrews 6.10, where it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. Catch this. The love you have shown them as you do what? Help his people. Now, for those of you who are new here and haven't learned this yet, I'm going to relearn you. Well, I'm stepping on all kinds of toes today, but they're religious toes. Religious toes need to be stepped on. Religious spirits need to be cast out in Jesus' name. We all learn stuff that wasn't true in the religious sector. You are not a child of God because you're born. You are a child of God because you're born again. You, you are a creation of God. He loves you. We want blessing for you. There are people in this fellowship at all levels of faith. We want to see you blessed, but the highest blessing you can ever know and experience is a relationship with Jesus. I can give you sandwiches and chocolate milk for the rest of your life, and you could still miss out on the most important thing on the planet, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to leave with, and I don't know what, 
you know, how our wheels turn in our heads after we hear stuff like this. I feel like I've challenged, I was challenged by some of this. How I treat the disciples of Jesus is how I treat Jesus. Because the least of these, I've just, I hope I explained, the least of these, and he talks about Matthew 25, are his followers. Now, we are an outreach church. We'll always be an outreach church. We always want to bring in the broken and lead them into relationship with Christ. We'll never stop doing that. But the truth is, if you're always just about outreach, we're not caring for something that's very dear to the heart of God, which is the people of God. And when people do get brought in through outreach, they need a lot of work. Some of you are a trip to work with, I want to tell you. <laughs> and we're willing to do it. We want to do it. But it takes more than one or two to do it, right? We need to work in the maturity of the people of God so that they are strong enough to reproduce themselves. Amen? Amen. So, when I treat Jesus' disciples well, I treat him well. The least of these are the family.